everyone. International Fight Week is here. UFC 175 and the Ultimate Fighter finale, Team Edgar and Team Penn, taking place this Saturday and Sunday from the Mandalay Bay Convention Center, Mandalay Bay Event Center, excuse me, uh, in Las Vegas. Today on the call, we are joined by middleweight champion Chris Wiseman, challenger Leoto Machida with translator Derek Lee, women's bantamweight champion Ronda Rousey and challenger Alexis Davis, as well as lightweight legends and tough coaches Frankie Edgar and BJ Penn. At this time, Amber, let's go ahead and open up the questions. Back in Carnaco with Boston Herald. Very much. Uh, this question is for BJ Penn. Uh, BJ, wh- why would you say that you get so uh, fixated on avenging your losses? Uh, no, I, I don't know um, about uh, fixated. I believe everyone out there, you know, uh, would uh, want to, uh, you know, have have another shot at somebody that beat them. Uh, you know, I remember uh, when Frankie was fighting Gray Maynard, he said, you know, uh, that's the one loss he wanted to avenge or whatever. You know, everybody, uh, I think that's just part of life. I, I just think that's human nature, bottom line. Can you make one of the habits that you've had to drop compared to when you fought 155 or even 170? Um, Yeah, of course, I never had to drop weight for 170. Uh, so, uh, you know, for this, I've, I just uh, kept my diet clean and, you know, I'm trying to eat all the, the healthy stuff. Uh, you know, the salmon and, and all the other stuff out there. So, you know, I, I pulled the weight down, and uh, I, I should be fine uh, come uh, stepping on the scale on Saturday. What did you find the difference between coaching against Jens Palmer and coaching against Frankie? Uh, well, me and Jens, uh, we kind of had an emotional thing going on. Me and Frankie has always been professional, you know. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, for, I, I think uh, uh, Frankie had a lot more um, – a lot more uh, as the sport evolved. Frankie had a lot, uh, a lot more, uh, you know, um, a lot, a lot of better coaches. I'm not not saying that the coaches that Jens brought in weren't good, but Frankie had a, had a large pool of guys that he could pull from. So, you know, it, it was it was it was very, uh, you know, very good to go up against, you know, somebody who was so prepared as Frankie was. And, you know, besides that, everything everything just kind of went as normal. Just, just two more for you, BJ. Talking about keeping it professional with Frankie, does does that make it difficult uh, to want to put a hurting on him? Is that something that's important to you to to psych yourself into wanting to to hurt your opponent, no matter what your relationship is like with him? No, no. Actually, um, you know, I, you know, I, I I see, you know, it, it's it's uh, not really emotional thing, but I, I see that he really wants to uh, make me retire, and I'm thinking, well, how am I going to feed myself? How am I going to feed? my kids if I retire, but uh, I'll remember that next Sunday when we step in the ring. And finally, what is this latest run really about for you? What does it come down to? Uh, this latest run uh, really comes down, it, you know, I just, uh, this is what I do. This is what I've done my whole life. This is all I know. And, uh, and uh, you know, we just, uh, I'm, it just comes down to uh, having fun and, and doing what I love. Thank you. And we'll go next to Jason Jones with Sacramento B. Hello, hi. My question is for uh, Alexis. Hey, what's up? Hi. I was just—I wanted to know, just uh, starting off, what was your experience like training in Sacramento, uh, Uriah's gym, and what did you, what were you able to gain from that? Uh, it was great to be able to, to kind of air it. You know, it's like a wrestling school that I've never been to. The uh, amount of just the amount of people that you have to train with, and, and different body types, and, and different skill levels. You know, wrestling. You know, take down to in general isn't something that I've been trying to work on for. You know, not just my last couple of fights, but for a while now. You know, just kind of make that transition, obviously, from standing to the ground. Uh, but you know, it was a great experience. I, I really like uh, the coaches out there, Uri and Lance. They're, you know, they're really hands on. They they help me out with different positions and you know, different key movements that I got to do to just you know change my game up. And was there a reason specifically why you uh, went, you came to Sacramento as opposed to the many other places you could have gone to to work on your wrestling? Um, I do train some of my wrestling over at CSA, um, which is mainly my uh, stand-up academy. But, you know, uh, they've been trying to get me to come uh, because obviously we have that connection with MMA Inc. with a lot of the guys. So they've been trying to get me to to come up there for a while now. And, you know, it just hadn't worked out timing. And, you know, 
starting off a, a new camp. We got a, a you know a good amount of time learning about the site, so it was um, it, it was a good change up to, to kind of have that experience to go out there. And going into Saturday, how how much more prepared do you feel in, in that aspect of your fight game? Having a good time out there working on your wrestling. Um, I I feel really good. I feel in great shape. You know, this is you know the best I've felt in a while. You know, not just physically, but you know mentally, and you know to to have the guys out there to prepare. It's just even you know, uh, Ron is a great fighter. She adds great pressure onto her opponents, and you know that's you know one of the the key components to my my training camp is to have people like that, and and they can really push you out there. Right. Well, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. We'll go next to Matt Erickson with USA Today. Hi, guys. Thanks again for uh, being on the call today. I just had a quick one for uh, Leoto and one for Alexis. If I could start with Leoto. Uh, Leoto, you know, we're kind of in the in the day and age when trash talking can get a lot of things done, and yet you're one of the guys that uh, you don't really subscribe to that theory. So I was wondering if you could maybe talk to me about, about why you don't and, and some of the benefits of, of not engaging in much trash talking. E o Tele está falando que a gente está numa época que todo mundo fala muito mal dos adversários antes da luta, mas você é um cara que não faz isso, né? Fala um pouco o que, que você acha de, dessa tática de, de muita gente. Não, eu não... Acho que eu, eu gosto de mostrar o que realmente eu sou. Entendeu, Derek? Eu, não, eu quero vender a luta de uma outra maneira. Eu quero vender a luta através do, do que eu estou mostrando na luta. E eu não estou preocupado com... Convender a luta dessa forma, né, para às vezes ofender meu adversário, nada disso. Eu prefiro ser mais profissional. Yeah, I try to show uh, exactly what I am. So I'm always trying to sell the fight in, in a different way. I'm trying to sell the fight with the way that I'm fighting in the octagon, and uh, I, I don't want to be the guy that's offending my opponent before the fight. Has he ever noticed any type of a, a negative impact on uh, not talking as much in terms of being able to market himself? Obviously, it. it uh, it got him title shots in the past, and it has a title shot for him now. But he has he noticed any any negative impact to that? Você acha que tem algum impacto negativo você não falar dos adversários do, no passado no teu marketing? Eu acho que não. Acho que não. Talvez pelo contrário, né? É, é, você, quando eu falo, eu tento falar o melhor possível, achar uma coisa boa no meu adversário, porque não quero falar mal de ninguém. Isso não é, não é a minha característica. No, I don't think so. I think it's actually quite the opposite, and I'm always trying to find a, a positive side to my opponent. It's, it's not me to go and try to fight fault. Gotcha. And then, Alexis, if I could ask you the same question, you know, if, uh, can you talk a little bit about why you don't tend to go down that, that road? I know you've spoken a little bit about it in the past. Uh, that's because if I try, I kind of sound like an idiot. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not, you know, it's just not who I am. So I... Uh, yeah, you have to, especially the level that you are, respect your opponents and, you know, how much they've come, you know, how far they've come. And, you know, it's, well, really, what am I going to say? You know, I, uh, when I, when I look at my opponents, uh, you know, I, I'm looking more at them as a, a technical standpoint. And, uh, you know, it's just, you know, not, not in my personalities. I'm, you know, I just, I'm, usually apologetic and you know I joke around a lot but it's just you know it's just who I am do you feel like there's a, like a good mix of, of the two sides in the sport right now I mean folks like yourself who don't tend to do it and you know some of the like like a Shale on and who's well known for it is there a good mix yeah there is and you know I I think you know it's great it's you know everybody's different you know it's different personalities and I I, I love, like, listening to, like, guys like Taylor. I think it's, you know, it is. It's entertaining. And then one, one final one. Have you noticed an impact on that, you know, yourself, of, of being able to market yourself or, or, you know, a promotion being able to market you because you're um, not cut from that cloth? You know what? It is hard, you know. I That's uh, the hard part of about being, I guess, myself, that, you know, I am kind of quiet and, you know, I I don't really speak up when you know the but it's a when it's the time to speak up and you know obviously I think if I would have been more vocal especially early on in my career you know maybe I would have got my chances a little bit sooner but you know there's a reason and 
you know, a time that this is why, you know, I got the title fight now and, you know, maybe it's just my time. Gotcha. All right. Thanks so much, you guys. Good luck this weekend. Thank you. As a reminder to our phone audience, that is star one at this time for questions or comments. Once again, star one, and we'll go next to Steve Fitel with Asbury Park Press. Hey, my question is uh, for Frankie. Obviously, from the uh, Great Maynard series, you can relate to trying to avenge a loss. How does it feel to be on the other side? Yeah, you know, it's really the same. I approach it the same. I mean, uh, you know, I want to. I want to. You know, when you want to avenge a loss, you want to win really bad. And, and when you want to make sure you don't get avenged, you want to win just as bad. So, uh, you know, it's the same approach. Do you uh, do you understand uh, BJ's uh, passion to try and uh, get that win back over you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've been there before, and uh, you know, it's just your competitive nature, and um, that's just. Uh, I think all fighters uh, want a chance of redemption. All right. Uh, PJ had done Ultimate Fighter before. This was your first run at it. Have, having had the majority of the show air, how, how was the experience for you? It was a good experience. You know, it's uh, it was a lot more work than expected. Um, you know, you, you got to put a lot of time in. But uh, all in all, I walked away with uh, you know good good memories and a good experience. Did uh, did family and fr- did family and friends here in uh, here in Jersey enjoy the opportunity to watch you on TV on a week to week basis? Yeah, for sure. I definitely got a good response, uh, you know, especially from, from people that are close to me. And, you know, if, uh, even people I don't know, just fans who have been coming up and just seem to enjoy, enjoy the show. Uh, this is now, you know, going on two years in the uh, featherweight uh, division. How, how do you feel you uh, fit in there? I feel I feel good, you know. Um, again, I don't have to cut much weight even for, even for 45, so uh, you know, I feel comfortable. It's not, like, stressful on my body or anything. And, uh yeah, everything is, is pretty much going the way I expect it. All right. Thanks a lot, Frankie. Hey, I, I, I'd like to make just one clarification uh, about uh, I never never said I wanted to retire BJ. You know, that's not my style. Um, you know, I, my my goal is just to make sure I win this fight, and whatever BJ decides to do with his career after is, uh, is nothing, nothing, nothing based on, on what I what I say or do. And we'll go next to Neil Davidson with the Canadian Press. Yes, thank you. Uh, My first question is for Alexis. Uh, Alexis, you strike me as a very down-to-earth person. Uh, I wonder if uh, things have changed for you with the title shot. Are you you recognized, uh, or even before the title shot, I guess I should ask, with your fights in the UFC, are you recognized in the street? Are you able to live life normally without notoriety? Uh, Yeah, pretty much. You know, I have... You know, I'm not, I'm probably nowhere near, you know, recognized as much as uh, the other guys. But, you know, you get it here and there. But uh, I figure I, I'm i pretty down to earth. And, you know, I, I love meeting fans and I love meeting people. And, you know, you get more, it's only, you know, it gets a little bit uh, trickier when you when you have people coming through the gym. But, uh, it, it's you know, I don't know. I'm just enjoying life. You know, it's, it's a great experience. I just got to be happy for where I am. Not many people have this opportunity. Mm-hmm. Thank you, and, and BJ, if I, I can ask you a question, you're yes, you're obviously a veteran of uh, of this sport. Uh, many things have changed since you started. Obviously, the profile, the money is much better. Is it all good? What's happened to MMA, or are there any things you missed from the early days? Uh, no, I you know, of course, there's a lot of things I miss. You know, um, before you knew every single guy on the card, and it was just such a small knit group, but. Uh, I'm really happy for what happened to MMA because it's given so many people the opportunity to get involved, you know, with the sport that everybody loves. And, you know, I'm just just, uh, so grateful for uh, what the UFC has done. And just finally, obviously you're focused on this fight, but have you thought about what the future afterwards, will you continue to compete? Uh, You you know, uh, you know, of course, you know, the answer is going to come out first thing first. Frankie Edgar, and uh, you know, from there, uh, we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out what's next. Okay, thank you, and good luck. Thank you. As a reminder to our phone audience, that is star one at this time for questions or comments, and we'll go next to Heidi Fang with MMA Fight Corner. Hello, my first question is for Rhonda. Uh, you guys really said that part of your goal as a champion is to constantly challenge yourself in each fight. 
Can you talk about the main challenge that Alexis Davis presents for you? Um, well, Alexis is definitely the most well-rounded fighter I've ever come against. She's one of the most experienced, and I think her, her coaching is one of the best that I've ever come up against. And so um, I think the greatest challenge is whatever tools that she does have, I know that she'll use them in the most intelligent way possible, and being so well-rounded, she has a lot of tools to pick from. After this fight for you, Rhonda, there's been some talk that you'd like to take a break after fighting Alexis. Uh, will you do that, or are you looking to possibly get on the end of the year card? I heard that you're also interested in doing that. Yeah, I'd I like to fight again on New Year's and um, take a little break in between that. And, but, you know, the UFC knows if there's an emergency or if they need me, I'll step up you know, on 24 hours' notice. Great, thank you. And for Chris Weidman, you constantly said that you want to earn your respect from the fans. Do you feel that because you were the man to dethrone Anderson Silva that you'll ever get that, no matter who you fight? Um, I don't think I've ever, I think I'm always, you know, I think everybody always is going to have critics out there. And it's not really one of my main motiv motivating factors to, you know, silence, silence those critics because they're always going to be there. Um, so that's not, that's not really one of the big things in my mind. Thank you. And uh, last question for me for Alexis. Uh, I was curious with the fight being a five round fight. A lot of people said that you lost steam against Jessica I in the third round, and I was curious how you changed things to work on the cardio to be able to go a full five. Oh, you know what? Uh, uh, I have I have been pushing my cardio a lot, and you know it's not just a you know, five round fight. It's a five round fight against, you know, potentially five round fight against uh, Ronda Rousey, where you know you don't really get that, you know, five seconds to take a breath in there. So you know, obviously that's from the get go. That's something that I've been working on. Great, thank you for the time. And we'll go next to Ken Pichna with MMAWeekly.com. Um, this is for Alexis. Um, leading up to this fight, it seems that a lot of the focus when Ronda's doing interviews and stuff has been on, you know, what about Gina Carano or Chris Cyborg or how would you do against a judo player and stuff. And you, you're almost kind of like an afterthought when people talk to her leading up to this fight as far as how, how's the fight going to go with Alexis. Is that something that's a positive for you that kind of takes the the shine away from you so that you can just focus on your training and, and preparing for Ronda, or is that a negative for you? Yeah, you know, to be honest, it doesn't really bother me. You know, it's, it's fine. You know, I'm going to train the same way I'm going to train, regardless if they're talking about me or not. You know, I'm putting everything I, in, you know, I have into this camp, so, you know, maybe I haven't got as much of attention, you know, as... You know, so maybe her, her previous opponents or, you know, the opponents that maybe some other fans would like to see. But, you know, it's all it's all fine because, you know, when you step into the octagon, you know, what's going to happen is what's going to happen, regardless of what people say. And what about when Rhonda does talk about you? She seems to hold you in pretty high regard, and she's shown a lot of um, respect for your skills in the cage and stuff. I mean, how does that How does that affect your approach to the fight? I think that doesn't really affect my approach to the fight, you know. Um, you know, it, it's awesome, you know, I feel, you know, it, it's it's great to have, you know, maybe if uh, maybe the media or, you know, obviously you can be um doesn't say as much about me or whatnot, but, um, of course, it's only great to hear positive things about yourself, but, you know, like I said, like, the fight's a fight. All right, thanks, Alexis. And and for Rhonda, kind of along those same lines that y you tend to get asked a lot more about other fighters and, and movies and stuff like that. Does that is does that serve as a distraction for you when you're training for somebody like Alexis, or do, are you just used to it and you just kind of block it out and do your thing, or how does that work for you? Um, I'm used to way more fantastical distractions than you know. <laughs> A couple different questions. Um, it's actually kind of nice to get different questions and just saying ones all the time. Like, 
how do you feel? Uh, what do you think about your opponent? What are you going to do? I mean, they're still asking all the elective questions as well. Um, but, yeah, they got a couple of extra topics to touch on as, uh, on top of that. And I, I don't think that's such a bad thing that they have a variety of things to cover. And uh, it, it's not like no one ever asks about electives. That's just it's that not... It's not all that they have to ask about, and I don't think that's a bad thing at all. Okay, great. Thank you. And we'll go next to Neil Springer. Hi, a uh, question for uh, Rhonda. Um, you know, you were talking earlier kind of about potentially taking a break, and, you know, you've worked a really sort of hectic schedule as champion. I'm curious sort of what is the secret to kind of not burning out? A lot of coffee. That's porn. Um, and I don't know. I just, I don't really do that well with, with downtime. So I'm always in the gym regardless. So a lot of fighters like to have their fight and then they go and chill out for a month or two. But um, I, I get in trouble for sneaking back into the gym sometimes two days after a fight. I, I'm just always in shape and I'm always ready. And um, I, I don't really like resting too much. That high after a win is what I enjoy the most not sitting around and resting and I can really only enjoy the rest while that high still lingers so uh, it's only so long that I can enjoy sitting on the couch and eating as much pie as I want and then going to the gym and pressing repeat I, I really need that that big goal and obstacle to stay excited about what I'm doing and I, I got offered a, a way later fight day and uh, after fighting Nisha and seeing how ring rust really did affect me, I, I know that I will be a better fighter at the end of the year if I fight in the summer. And so I, I like to do it just to keep myself sharp because we don't really have the luxury that, that boxers have, that if they if a champion takes a long fight off, they can have a tune-up fight to get ready for another big title fight. I just have to keep title fights to keep from getting that ring rust. And there's been a bit of emphasis on sort of the grappling in this fight. Uh, you know, obviously your judo background and uh, Alexis having a Brazilian and Japanese jiu-jitsu background. Um, there's been a lot of legendary fights in MMA when you put judo against uh, BJJ. I'm curious if that's something that's kind of fun to think about, some of those legendary, legendary fights going into this one. Yeah, it, it is really fun to, to think about because coming from judo, when I first started watching MMA, that was one thing that pissed me off so much is that Everyone assumed that everything would beat judo. Everyone would be like, any wrestler can beat any judo player, and any any jiu-jitsu player could beat any judo player. And I, I was just always really annoyed by the complete lack of respect that the sport got. And um, I see that changing, definitely, and people saying that any judo player would get tapped out by any Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. And uh, I, I totally disagree. I think that you, you can definitely get away with not having any ground game in judo but if you are the, the type of person to be able to pull off actually being someone that can submit people in judo, I mean, you only got a couple seconds to make that work. So if you're the type that actually does make it work on the ground in judo, you're one of the best in the world, and um, I'm happy to get an opportunity to really showcase that. Right. Thank you very much for the time. No problem. And we'll go next to Daniel Flynn with Free Art Sports. Hi, my question's for Lyoto and BJ. Um, it's about the, the fight that's not going to be taking it's about the fight that's not going to be taking place at USC 175 between uh, Silva and Sean and indirectly. Um, wh what is your take on the changes in drug testing in the sport over the course of your long career? Is, is things are, are things getting more stricter? Um, are they weeding out the cheaters in a better way than they were when you started uh, your careers? Viu, se ele tá falando em questão do, da, da luta do Vanderlei e do Sonnen ter caído, o que, que você acha do, dos exames de dor? Como é que isso mudou ao, ao decorrer da sua carreira? Você acha que estão nos trapaceiros que estão caindo? Olha, hoje é difícil falar, né, Rodrigo? Assim, porque acho que o exame de dor ele vem para ajudar, né, vem para ajudar o esporte, mas é difícil falar assim. Porque tenta botar todo mundo igual. É, acho que um dos objetivos é isso, colocar todo mundo igual. Mas é difícil de falar assim, se realmente está sendo tão efetivo assim, né, ou ele está só mascarando uma coisa que existe. Não sei, é difícil falar. 
you know, it's hard to say uh, it, what it's what it's really doing, but it, it, I think in reality the the drug testing is to equalize sport so that everyone's on the same level. But uh, I, I don't know how effective it is or not. But that, I think that's the main point is for everyone to be the same. And uh, yeah, you know what I I I was uh, I'm really excited. I'm I'm really excited now uh, that they that they can test for the HGH and the, and the EPO. I've always suspected that people were, were doing those things and not just the steroids. So it's very exciting and, and very, uh, uh, very uh, gratifying to, uh, to finally see that the, the playing field, you know, people are going to start thinking twice about what they put in their body and the playing field will, will be uh, much, more, uh, much more equal, you know, and, and that's just a huge, you know, uh, Chelsea is actually a personal buddy of mine, you know, it's sad to see what Chelsea is going through, but if you want to talk about the future of the sport, the safety of the fighters, and I've always spoke out against it, it's just, I'm so excited now that they can get the HGH and the EPO, that's, I was just, I put a smile on my face. Guys, do you, um, when you see Kiel Sonnen saying he's, he was taking these drugs for, uh, you know, trying to, to procreate with his, with his wife, and then it comes out that he popped positive on a, a second test with, with drugs that have nothing to do with, you know, fertility and that kind of thing, does this make you laugh? Does this, I mean, at a certain point, it, it, you know, you see excuse after excuse from fighters who, who test positive, um, and I, I think, every you know, the educated fans know that this is just excuse making and not sort of legitimate, um, you know, defense against this. Do, do the fighters themselves do they laugh when they hear this, or is this, is this taken seriously when, when people uh, come up with excuses like, you know, that they're going to, uh, you know, they need these drugs to, to have kids and that kind of thing? Uh, well, with the EPO, I'm sure probably gives them better endurance in bed, right? You know. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I, it, it is, it's, it's, you know, for me, I, you know, I'm only speaking for myself, you know, I've been around in the sport, I've been around with all the other different gyms, I've seen all kinds of other different stuff, so only speaking on my, uh, on, on what I believe, you know, and on my own personal morals, everybody's morals are different, everybody has a, the ends justifies the means, hey, if, if I didn't do it, you know, I would have got cut and I wouldn't have this big house or whatever it is, but, uh, you know, I'm I'm old fashioned, and that's just me. Joe, o que você acha que o Sonny falou que ele estava usando muitas coisas para que ele queria ter filhos com a esposa e tal? Aí ele vai e apego de novo em outro exame. Você, você ri quando você vê essas coisas? Você acha que é, são só desculpas? Oh, Derek, eu não sou um cara de julgar ninguém não, viu? Assim, eu acho que pela substância que o que o, o Sonny estava tomando, assim, eu não sei se realmente era é, só, só desculpas, não, não sei, né? Porque eu já ouvi falar, eu fui olhar sobre, né? Parece que parece que é para estimular o natural, alguma coisa desse tipo. Então, acho que não, não sei se é só des, desculpas. Eu não sou, eu não gosto de estar julgando ninguém, entendeu? Não é o meu papel isso. Cada um faz o que sabe, o que acha importante. Yeah. Uh, I'm not really someone to judge anyone on, on what they do, and I, I did do some research on, on some of those things, and, and there are uh, some methods out there that say it, it will help fertility naturally or, or whatnot, but it's not really my place to, to judge him. I mean, he, he knows what, what he's doing and what's best for him. And we'll go next to Case Keeper with Las Vegas Sun. Hi, uh, a few questions for Frankie, please. Uh, Frankie, I think we all kind of know the origin of this fight, that DJ asked to fight you again, and Dana said he wanted to talk to you and get your thoughts. Uh, I'm just wondering, what was your reaction back then? I can't imagine you uh, saw this fight coming. So what did you think when Dana first uh, threw you this idea? Yeah, I was uh, definitely not expecting DJ to be, to be the guy I was going to uh, possibly coach against. I know we were throwing the idea around me, throwing the idea about me coaching the show, and um you know, uh, I thought I was gonna I was gonna miss the opportunity just because uh, I really couldn't get someone. But then he brought the name BJ to me, and you know I'm pretty easy going. Uh, I, I just jumped jumped to it and said yes. Right? Uh, did it ever cross your mind to, to turn it down? Did you have any second thoughts? Thinking I've already beat this guy twice. I mean, why do I have to do this again? 
No, not, honestly, not at all. You know, right away, I mean, I, I, I kind of he asked me. I said yes. I didn't have to talk to nobody or anything. I didn't have to call him back. I just said yes. Right. Um, and it's been four years since the first two fights against BJ. I'm just wondering, what do you remember most about those nights, and uh, which one was more rewarding, winning the belt the first time, or uh, kind of beating him even worse the second? Uh, you know, I think they're both, you know, rewarding in, in, in their own right. Um, you know, I guess doing it the second time was, uh, was a little reassuring just because everybody thought the first time was a fluke and I was able to get it done the second time. So I guess, uh, you know, that, that might have stuck out a little more for me. Thanks. And then just, uh, one question for BJ. Uh, BJ, taking you back to when you, uh, asked for this fight, did, did you, uh, did you feel like because of the right relationship you had with, uh, Frankie, he was going to accept it or, or were you worried that he might say, uh, I, I don't really want to fight this guy a third time? He, um, you know what, uh, you know, um, I, I didn't know, uh, Dana, Dana just kind of, we, that, uh, Frankie's name came up and, uh, me and Dana, you know, uh, I talked to Dana, I said, you know, get back in, avenge a couple of my losses and, uh, Frankie's name came up, everything got put together, you know, and, uh, you know, I, the way I look at it is, you know, the first time, I've never asked to, uh, to fight Frankie. This is the first time I've ever asked to fight Frankie. When I first had to fight Frankie, I was like, really, yeah, Frankie, who is, let me check it out, and this and that. And then Frankie comes out prove, proving himself, you know, and Frankie now, you know, one of the, one of the best of all time uh, in the UFC. And, uh, you know, I, it definitely mm -hmm. is a, a fight I'm looking forward to, you know. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. And we'll take our final question from Neil Davidson with the Canadian Press. Yes, uh, my question is for Lioto. Um, forgive a question about a different sport, but I know he's getting ready for his fight, but the eyes of the world are on Brazil in the World Cup. I wonder if uh, he's a soccer fan and whether he's following the tournament. Tenho seguido assim a Copa, vamos ver. O Brasil joga antes da minha luta, vamos ver como é que vai ser esse jogo. Yeah, I like watching uh, the World Cup. I've been following Brazil. Uh, the last game was very emotional, and they play again uh, right before my fight. So let's see what happens that weekend. And just one follow-up, if I may, to any of the fighters: uh, the UFC bills itself as real as it gets. In soccer, sometimes there's debate about players simulating fouls and injuries. It's part of the game to try and draw a, a foul. Anyone have any thoughts about that aspect of soccer? It's totally different from what you do in a cage. E yeah, aquela questão de todo mundo se machucando das faltas no futebol, o que você acha disso? Vindo de um atleta do MMA. Acho que isso acontece, né? É, é... É, o cara se machucar, acho que não pode rendimento de alto rendimento, acho que é normal isso. Por isso que é super importante você ter uma equipe que realmente possa é, ajudar você né, a, a mensurar o treino, né, saber até onde você pode ir, até onde você não pode ir, o que pode machucar, qual o treino. Então, isso aí é super importante. Eu acho que em qualquer lugar, um esporte como esse, é de alta intensidade, então é normal para os caras se machucarem, e é por isso que o seu time entra regulate your training and tell you what you can and you can do and, and keep you healthy. Uh, okay. You know what? The, the, I think that's the most, that's the, that's the funniest part. I think it's hilarious. It's just awesome. It's hilarious when they do that. Rhonda, what do you think? Uh, well, that's what happens when you have a, a sport where John and Fowles is really beneficial. I mean, I've seen, I watched the NBA and someone will barely pass somebody and this big giant seven foot dude will just hit the ground and go sliding across the room like it was seen in the exorcist and um it probably if if fouls are beneficial in, in MMA then you would see a lot more of it in our sport as well. Okay. Thank you very much, all of you good luck. Uh -huh.